Thank you, Angela, and thanks to all the uh, previous speakers. <laughs> Actually, we could have just start, stopped right there and opened it up to questions, because obviously you covered a lot of ground uh, in your various presentations, and I, I really appreciate the various uh, <clears throat> things that were, that were touched on. Could, is the, um, yeah, that's going okay. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, <clears throat> ask the question off the bat, just how many of you actually um, been up there and seen that and experienced that for yourself? So quite a few people have here this evening. And that's, that's really important because that's a lasting memory, I'm sure, in your minds. And when we talk about this this evening, you, you too will have a lot to say about what those felt experiences really were. The kind of thing that I, I want to say about this is that <clears throat> is that, you know, when you look at the Athabasca tar sands and you look at what's happened up there, it is a colossal development, but it's been going, the planning of this and the work on this has been going on for at least almost a century. It actually marks that around 1913, and so therefore in 2013 will be a full 100 years uh, since the, the work has been really concentrated in trying to open up the tar sands and do something uh, about it. You're dealing with the fact that uh, uh, what they call the tar sands riddle, and that is that, uh, that uh, uh, you've got this bitumen that's located deep, in some cases deep below the Earth's crust, in some cases just below the, earth, the, the, the surface of the Earth. And the question has been how to extract that bitumen, and secondly, how to separate the oil from the bitumen. And those are the two processes that have been developed and, and have been going on to, to create the, the technology that has given rise to, to the tar sands. And in that sense, one must, must uh, acknowledge the fact that it's quite a technological marvel that has been developed there. The problem, of course, is that it has such humongous impacts on the environment. And I will argue tonight it also has Im humongous impacts on our economy in a very distorted way, and it also has huge impacts on our energy future. And I think these are the kinds of things which I hope we will get a chance to uh, get into and delve into in the course of the evening. One of the things which I'd like you to get into the framework of, though, even though you've been to the tar sands in some cases and you've heard about it and talked about it a little bit, it's important to step back for a moment and think of this in terms of the broader sweep of history itself. The country, this country, Canada, has had different spurts of major industrial development and growth. We remember the CPR, the Canadian Pacific Railway from coast to coast, which really opened up the country and was a national project and a national dream. One can think of the industrial development that took and build up of infrastructure that took place uh, accompanying the Second World War. One can think of uh, big hydro developments that have taken place in this country, like the James Bay hydro development. Uh, and in all of these cases and in others, you, we have had a major industrial breakthrough and a major industrial growth spurt. And that historical bursting of industrialization in each of those cases has characterized the moment of history that we were in at that time and has characterized the future of the country. Well, I would like to suggest tonight that we look at the Alberta tar sands in the context of being one of those mega energy developments that is going to cast a huge impact on the future of this country, at least for the first quarter of this 21st century. And I say that because what has happened is that the tar sands really has moved into the very center of our history and the very center of our economy and the very center of our politics, which I will argue tonight. And it's something that I think we need to understand its full impact. And therefore, it's not just an Alberta issue, as was said. It is very much a national issue, and it's becoming increasingly a binational issue between Canada and the United States, and it will eventually become an international issue before we're finished. This is a battle of our times, and we must learn to uh, uh, grasp it, seize the moment, and start to do something about it. I think as we look back at, at, at what has happened so far and look at today, and now we've got this latest election finished and over with, we're back with the Harper government, and this is a defining moment. 
And we need to understand that, without being overly partisan at this point, but I want to say that we do have in place a man who is Prime Minister who really has said that the tar sands is uh, the mega project of, of Canada, that it will make Canada the next energy superpower, and he has likened that tar, the tar sands itself to the building of the Great Wall of China and the uh, Egyptian pyramids. That's the kind of situation that we're in right now, and we need to understand that that Prime Minister thinks that way about the tar sands, because really, it has been protected and it has been secured by the government of Canada, and we've got to stop that from, quite frankly, happening in the future. In doing so, we need to keep in mind that he is also a part of the oil patch. His father worked for Imperial Oil, and uh, so does his brother. So when Jack was talking about Exxon and that particular incident that you were referring to, I mean, that's pretty damn close to home in terms of protection and the interests at stake here. So I don't want to get into that in, in, any, in, in the kind of detail of, of the personality uh, criticism or anything like this. I just want us to understand the, what we're dealing with right now and how important this is in terms of the future of the country. <clears throat> so I'm going to suggest that we look at three or five segments this evening. One uh, dealing with what is the tar sands industry, briefly, then looking at its, the impact of that tar sands industry on the economic crisis that we're experiencing right now, then look at the impact on the environment crisis, then look at the impact on the energy crisis, and finally say something about the new petropolitics uh, that are in front of us. So let's move uh, ahead with this and if I can get my glasses on here, we can start to work. Is that showing right? No, no. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay. When you look back at the tar sands itself and the discovery of what was going on, Really, uh, the indigenous peoples of the time, the First Nations people, knew about this black glue that existed up there in, in, in the Athabasca region. They actually used it to work with their canoes and in patch, you know, in sealing their canoes. They used it for heating, uh, 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 heating uh, with fire and things like that to heat themselves. Uh, but uh, it was in, 19, it was in uh, 1774 that uh, there were two explorers, one by the name of Peter Pond from the United States and the, another by the name of uh, Alexander Mackenzie, whose, uh, uh, whose uh, name the, the river was uh, named after. And uh, it, these are the people that really uh, started to talk more widely about what this uh, phenomenon was regarding the tar sands itself. The development of the tar sands industry is something that has taken place, as I indicated before, over a full century, beginning in the early part of the 20th century, right up until the present time. And so it, it began in, in those days, it grew and developed, the technology grew and developed. In 1951, there was a huge uh, oil sands uh, uh, conference that was uh, convened by the then Premier Manning. Uh, in 1951 to, uh, to bring together the biggest oil companies and the governments together to talk about the future of the oil sands and its development. And so this is the kind of uh, process and history that lies behind what we're talking about this evening.